I've got the top of the hour, so let us begin. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a terrific guest on one of the great topics of our time, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now, today's topic is one of immense importance to us, and also to me personally, it turns out. Uh, we've been studying, discussing, exploring the implications of COVID-19 since it came out of Wuhan. We've been exploring it in all kinds of dimensions, the impact of COVID on geopolitics, on pedagogy, on faculty, staff, and student mental and physical health. And we've got a lot of back sessions on this. Now, for some, we may be entering a post-pandemic phase where the COVID-19 virus is simply endemic. It's a good question right now to the extent that that's true. Um, but we do know that colleges and universities around the world have had quite an experience for nearly three years. Everything from develop, helping develop vaccines, to doing community health, to closing, to moving online, to trying new calendars, all kinds of different changes. How can we put all this together? What have we learned and experienced from the pandemic that we can apply? What does it tell us about the future of higher education? Well, before I introduce, um, our guest, let me just say, the background behind me is unusual, it is the background of my bedroom, which I have not left for a week, because in some weird form of method acting, um, I came down with COVID on Saturday. Uh, so I am enjoying the delicious irony of having COVID while leading a session on COVID. Um, so hopefully I'll be fine today. If any of you notice me falling asleep or coughing or turning into a zombie, please let me know in the chat. Um, Benjamin Renton, though, um, is someone who knows more than almost anybody on earth about COVID and what it means for higher education. When it started, he was an undergrad at Middlebury College in Vermont. And Benji did an incredible amount of research, cobbling together all kinds of data streams from a wide range of source, rapidly scaling up on public health measures. And his tweeting and then his newsletter, which you can link to, you can see linked from the bottom left hand of the screen, became incredibly valuable resources. His even headed responses, his equanimity in response to a great deal of chaos and, and dynamics just was just remarkable. He graduated from Middlebury, got a job working in public higher ed, and is still an incredible analyst in this field. So without any further ado, uh, with a great deal of pride in the liberal arts tradition, uh, let me bring uh, Benji Renton up on stage. Hello, sir. Hi, How Brian. Oh, it's really good to see you. Thank you for coming. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you also for having the bit of subtle Vermont propaganda behind your head so we can all see. Thank you. Um, you Benji, the way we introduce people on this program is we ask, what are you working on for the next year? Um, so I'm curious, what's on deck for you? What are the big topics, the big projects that are going to be taking up most of your mind and most of your time? Yeah, I think my focus for the next year is, is twofold. I think, number one, a lot of the research that I've been doing in, in recent weeks and recent months has been focusing on how to document previous waves of the pandemic. And, mm. and, and you know, similar to the discussion that we're going to have today, just uh, discussing some of the lessons that we have learned. Um, a lot of the research that I've been focusing on uh, is on mortality, uh, disparities in mortality along racial and ethnic lines, um, as well yeah. as states and, and regions of the U.S., uh, so a fair amount of work on that. And I think there's still a lot more to learn when it comes to learning from the previous waves. And, and that leads to my next sort of area, which is preparing for future waves. Um, one of the projects that I've been working on works on hospital capacity uh, and looks at cases and, and other, you know, infection metrics in the community to determine when hospitals could face issues of capacity. For example, you know, in the Omicron wave yeah, yeah. last year, when people uh -huh. were filling hospital beds, is there a way to sort of have an early warning system and, you know, in place for hospitals and for communities? And so that's sort of the two areas that I, I've been focusing on most recently, and I think will we'll certainly take up a lot of time in the months to come. Oh, excellent. Excellent. That sounds like very, both extremely important work um, looking ahead, but also building really well on what's been going on uh, for the past three years. Thank you. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, I'm going to ask our guest a few questions. Uh, just to start him spilling the beans on what he knows and what he's been thinking. But then I want to yield the floor to you all. I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to ask your questions, to put forth your ideas. So as we go, start thinking of the uh, questions you'd like to ask. I guess 
on a positive note, Najee, what are some of the great achievements that higher education can point to? What are some of the strengths that COVID revealed that we should know about and embrace going forward in higher ed? Yeah, I think I approach this question first as a higher ed and sort of a, I was experienced the higher ed, you know, COVID transition. I was an undergrad, as you've mentioned, at Middlebury uh, during my junior year. I was actually studying abroad in China for the first uh, part of 2020. I left China in the end of January of 2020 wow. and returned to the U.S. Uh, in February, completed about four to five weeks of education at Middlebury on campus uh, in 2020, and, and then returned home to New York um, You know, when, when most colleges dismissed on campus at the time. And I think for me that the first thing that comes to mind about you know, what is higher ed in, in the positive space of what is higher ed learned from COVID is the ability to sort of have more flexible course modules. I think both in terms of you know, timing, we, we obviously, you know, you, we talked in previous editions of the forum, you know, about high flex and other, you know, methods of teaching um, virtual. Uh, but for me, I think one of the sort of best examples of that was I took a, a class in, in Chinese. I was an East Asian studies major. Uh, and my Chinese class in the fall of 2020 was actually taught remotely by a faculty member from our school in China. And so obviously, you know, that fall, most study abroad programs were suspended. Uh, we couldn't go to China. So instead, it really lended itself to having the professor from China, you know, use his skills and his expertise and, and teach us remotely, which I thought was really cool and a really innovative mode of teaching that we had really never uh, done before. Be because I think, you know, obviously students were abroad, you know, using the, the faculty there in China. Um, but but it was really interesting to have that experience of, of being taught not only by someone who was in the country, but the class focused on you know, Chinese social issues. And it was really interesting to have that experience, you know, vir virtually. I think, you know, the second thing that comes to mind, especially when it comes to student life, um, the outdoors has been certainly used as a low, lower risk space um, for student activities, student events. Um, and I think we really, you know, a lot of students in the higher ed space spent a lot of time outdoors, you know, in, in the past couple of years, I think more than, than has really done, students have really done before. And so I think, you know, using outdoor space and being creative in that way, we just were never really thinking about those issues. And I think the pandemic really prompted us to have discussions and, and reflect on, the, on those different ways that we can use education and, and space in that way. And that really counts in a, at a campus like Middlebury, which has such a beautiful outdoor campus, but that can really apply around the world. Yeah, no, definitely. I think not only the global footprint, but but even you know smaller campuses in city spaces having tents, for example, or or other different you know ways for students to have events and, and activities. I think you know all those were really important. What did you think of the uh, changes in academic calendars that schools like uh, Beloit did, where they tried to take a long semester and break it up into blocks so they'd be more flexible? Yeah, I think when it comes to that, you know, Colorado College being one that media comes to mind is having a block-like system before the pandemic, um, and, and they divide their year into nine or so, three-week blocks, you take one course. Um, I, I think breaking up, you know, the semester was was really beneficial, I know particularly from, from my own experience at Middlebury, we had decided, you know, the administration had decided to run the entire fall semester without any breaks. Uh, we usually had a four day, it ended up being like a, a long weekend, a four day break in the middle of October, sort of a midterm break. Uh, and just for a number of reasons, you know, COVID transmission risks, we, we, we didn't really have that break. And that was incredibly tough, I think, for a lot of students, um, you know, to go an entire fall without breaks. Um, so I, I think being able to break up the semester, being able to have um, other different flexible ways of, of teaching and delivering courses, I think is, is a huge plus. And I hope that colleges really consider implementing some of those changes, you know, maybe on a, a longer term basis going forward. Well, those are some excellent strengths. Um, and friends, uh, I would love to, you know, anything else that you would like to add to that um, pile of triumphs uh, would be great. Uh, welcome, Vanessa. I'm glad you could join us. Well, what did we do wrong? Where did we fall down? What are the mistakes that we made that we need to really address uh, for the next crisis? Yeah, I think you know when it comes to the pandemic as a whole, 
we've always heard about you know the science changing and, and and the science has been changing to an extent but it's also our understanding of the science um you know coming from the beginning for example recognizing that covid is is more likely to to be spread as an airborne disease for example in the air and seeing that you know disinfecting surfaces or or washing hands what wall may be useful is not the primary method to prevent transmission um, and, and I remember, you know, and, and in that vein, I think a lot of colleges really went into the fall 2020 semester just not knowing a huge amount, like all of us, uh, about how to keep students, faculty, and, and staff, and, and even members in the community um, safe from, from COVID infection and COVID illness. Uh, and so I think, you know, one of the things I, I remember on, on my campus in the fall, you know, people were wearing masks outside, which, which, you know, was our understanding really at the time and was the measures that we had at the time. And I think that's obviously changed in the last couple of years. Uh, I think obviously wearing a mask indoors is a, is a great idea, particularly in areas of high transmission or, or under surges. Um, but, but those different types of, of small adjustments, I think, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily we got it wrong at first, um, but but it's certainly you know our understanding of that has changed. I think also um, there's there was a lot of talk initially in the fall 2020 semester about a concept called harm reduction, which is often used um, in, in discussions on on HIV and, and other um, different viral illnesses. That you know basically you're using multiple layers of preventative strategies to reduce you know risk broadly defined. Um, and I think, you know, one of the primary ways to do that, which I think some colleges, you know, may not have done enough is, is pushing and motivating students to, to do things outside um, and to have events outside. And sometimes colleges may have been overly prescriptive in, in terms of restrictions you know, of gatherings outside. I think what we know and what we, you know, continue to, to understand is that having events outside to an extent, regardless of the amount of attendees or people in one space, is, is infinitely safer than having events inside. Um, so, you know, some colleges had patrols or people you know, or other different types of ways to limit sort of gathering broadly defined outside. And I, I think, at least in my opinion, you know, we should be encouraging those those outdoor um, events and outdoor activities because the alternative indoor events would would be a much riskier uh, riskier endeavor. Uh, obviously, this was all pre-vaccine, and I think the vaccine has certainly changed the calculus of, of a lot of those um, different types of, of planning and, and methods like that. Well, how did we uh, how did we handle the vaccines? Do you think uh, you know different campuses? The record seems to be uh, different campuses have had different policies. Everything from mandates to requirements to requests to varying depending on which vaccine brand was used and which uh, stage of vaccination was used. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think that the conversation around vaccine mandates has certainly been politicized in, in, the, in the past couple months and, and you know, a year or so. Um, research from the, the Davidson College's College Crisis Initiative has sort of tracked a lot of those mandates and has found that political drivers have been a huge factor in whether a college has a vaccine mandate or not. Um, and the discussion around vaccine mandates, I think, has, has changed also because our understanding of, of the limits of these vaccines ha has changed. You know, these vaccines are, are incredible. Um, they you know, prevent severe illness, hospitalization and death incredibly well. Um, but particularly in recent months with, with the Omicron variant and other subvariants, inf preventing infection was never really a goal to begin with because we never really had you know, discussed that in, in vaccine trials. Uh, but preventing infection is, is certainly not as, as attainable, at least fully, um, from, from the current vaccines that we have. If vaccines, you know, certainly reduce the likelihood um, of getting infected, but, but you know, the concept of breakthrough cases and, and other issues, you know, is, they're certainly there. Um, and so I think, you know, when it comes to vaccine mandates, I personally would, would support them. And, and the reason would be because I think it provides a baseline layer of protection um, for colleges and also the surrounding communities. And I'm sure, you know, the town gown relationship is something that we'll, we'll dive into throughout the course of the hour. Um, but, but thinking about, you know, colleges do not exist in a vacuum. And we've seen research uh, in particularly in the, in the 20 to 20, 2020 to 2021 school year uh, where students returned to college uh, and people in the community were infected as a result yeah. uh, of, you know, 
of transmission on college campuses. So I think you know vaccine mandates are certainly applicable still. Um, when it comes to boosters, I think that there's still a lot of open discussions on that. Um, but but I think also just you know, as one final point, communication has been key you know throughout the pandemic, particularly communications from you know college administrators to their students and to their faculty, and really trying to simplify you know vaccine requirements or, or booster requirements. You know, having a, a real simple explanation, having a real simple you know, set of requirements. You need to have this, this, and this to attend school. In, in you know, many cases, very similar to other vaccines that students take before they go to school. Um, I think you know, having that laid out simply, I think, is a, a really good strategy. That's a really good point. Um, I'm, I'm amazed at how much history you managed to elegantly bring together um, in just a few sentences, Benji. Um, I, I have more questions, but already questions are coming in. And again, if, if you're new to the forum, this is the venue for uh, you to have to share your questions. Uh, and we already have one uh, coming up from our dear friend and uh, several times guest, Tom Hames from Texas. And Tom says, there was already a lot of data on transmission in the fall of 2020. Do you think institutions ignored this because it conflicted with the desire for normality? Yeah, I don't know necessarily if, if institutions sort of had ignored um you know the, the data on transmission i think it may have been a question of, of feasibility you know i think one of the, the biggest topics particularly when i started writing my newsletter and, and working on on research in the late summer was was whether schools were going to return i think a lot of you know schools uh, attempted an in-person semester um for some people and uh, for some institutions that did not go very well um you know, particular institutions that, that shut down two or three weeks in, in the start of the year just because they had large COVID outbreaks. You know, I think there was certainly that quest for normality um, or, or returning to a, a normal semester. And it was just that the conditions in particularly in the summer and in the fall of 2020 were just really not conducive to having a restriction free semester. And I think yeah. not necessarily, you know, framing it not necessarily as restrictions, but but safety measures and public health measures, you know, masking, for example, you know, having events outdoors, ventilation. I saw someone had, you know, posted about ventilation on the chat, and that's certainly something that we can discuss in, in greater detail later. But, you know, ventilation um, and, and testing, all those tools can be used. Um, and I think for, for a lot of schools, you know, my own undergrad institution included, uh, Middlebury, you know, we had a very successful fall 2020 semester. Uh, and that could have been achieved, I think, even with the data that we had had, um, you know, at that present time. Well, good question, Tom. And, and thank you, um, Benji, for that really thoughtful answer. And if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a text question. So just hit you know, the very bottom of the screen, press that uh, question mark button and type in your cue so we can uh, uh, so we can hear from you. Um, uh, Vanessa uh, mentions ventilation, and I've got to just put in a Vermont plug because on the ventilation theme, University of Vermont students did invent the Vermontilator, um, you know, nice open source ventilator, which is pretty cool. But I'm, I'm curious what you, what you think about some of the impacts of ventilation. By that, sorry, it's an ill-formed question. I'm thinking in part about how we responded to the need for more ventilation, uh, how many across the spectrum of higher education, how many campuses, for example, opened windows or moved interior classrooms to exterior locations? Uh, what we did in, you know, in order to increase ventilation, did we add technology? Um, but then looking ahead too, I wonder, do you think we're gonna see any impact on higher education architecture? Uh, that is more building renovations, more building designs that have more doors, more windows, bigger windows, bigger doors, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think ventilation has certainly been a, a very complex topic and, and particularly um, in, in, at times sort of just a nebulous idea or concept just because, you know, it, it's hard for people to some, you know, sometimes understand that, oh, opening a window, that's going to make a huge difference or, you know, buying this air purifier, or this this fan. And, and I'm not you know personally an expert in ventilation, I think. You know, one person who is, is, is Dr. Joe Allen at Harvard, um, who has mm -hmm. written extensively on not only colleges and universities, but, but healthy buildings. You know, we spend 90% of our time indoors. And how do we make, you know, indoor spaces healthy, not just for, for COVID, but for other respiratory diseases and for viral illnesses and, and even allergies. 
Um, I, I think when it comes to sort of those different types of strategies, those can make an impact. Um, you know, and, and they don't have to be that expensive. I think we, we've often heard of, you know, ventilation upgrades, particularly in the K through 12 school space, less talked about in higher ed, um, but, but in the K through 12 school, you know, thinking about upgrading HVAC systems or upgrading, you know, other types of ventilation systems that schools may have. But there are other strategies that may be cheaper. There's a device called a Corsi Rosenthal box, which was developed by um, a scientist at the University of California. And it's a homemade sort of ventilation machine that you can construct with a couple of, of fans and like those air filters that you put in your air conditioning, those like long unit things, like a square thing, um, and, and you put it together. And those types of devices are extremely you know, effective. Um, and, and you know, while that may be sort of a, a cheaper method, you know, there, there are ways for schools and ways for indoor spaces to be upgraded. Um, you know, in terms of, of ventilation. I, th I think one other final point um, that I was just thinking about, you know, when there have been some studies on um, COVID transmission in colleges, particularly in the fall of 2020 and the spring of 2021, and a lot of the research, you know, came out and, and they found that most cl the classrooms were not a source of, of transmission. Most of the infections that were happening among students at the time were happening outside the classroom, which, which was understandable, you know, in, in residence halls, um, in, you know, other events, parties, social gatherings, all of that. Um, so, so classrooms, at least for the first year, were, were, were incredibly safe. You know, students were masked. Those were controlled spaces. Um, many classrooms had ventilation, um, you know, that, that was in place. Uh, and so I think, you know, when it comes to the next couple years, just thinking about ways that we can upgrade not just classroom spaces, but but residential spaces. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, every college needs to invest in having a full ventilation system in, in dorms. I know a lot of dorms do not have air conditioning because most students are not there for the summer, um, depending on obviously what part of the country you live in. Um, but, but thinking beyond the classroom and thinking into other spaces as well, I think would be certainly very important. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I'm thinking about that, uh, proposal for an enormous single dorm building. Uh, it's been built once before at Michigan. You may have seen this, which had uh, no exterior windows. Um, oh, yeah. And so that would be definitely a death trap in this case, unless, unless you know, you had sufficient ventilation through other means. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, thank you for that answer, rather. Uh, Eileen Frank in the chat shares a really nice how to uh, build a Corsi Rosenthal box. Uh, so that's a fun exercise for uh, for the maker maker mind, um, friends. Again, this is a this is the time for you to uh, think about your questions, uh, your comments, and your thoughts. I have a few more, but I want to make sure that I don't get in the way of the rest of you, uh, because this is your venue. Um, one question I have, Benji, um, is you know thinking about town gown relations. It seems like famously they can be quite vexed. Um, and I know my own alma mater, the University of Michigan, uh, twice was basically uh, smacked down once by the state and once by its county uh, for not following enough public health measures sufficiently, at least according to the county and state guidelines. Uh, and yet there were cases of universities that would uh, go bend over backwards to help their community by providing vaccines or providing tests. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, looking ahead a bit, what what can we learn from this experience? I mean, what does the what does COVID tell us about the future of town gown relations? Yeah, I think certainly, as you had mentioned, particularly in the early days of the pandemic and, and in the summer of 2020, the relationship I think between many colleges and the surrounding towns was certainly fraught. You know, people were spending time at home, you know, in, in the local towns, and they were dreading the possible reopening of schools uh, and, and in some cases wrote op-eds or letters in their local newspapers, you know, saying why students should not return and, and why colleges shouldn't go through with their, their reopening plans. And I think what we had sort of learned over that first pandemic academic year was that colleges can use their places, you know, in the town gown relationship matrix, you know, depending on sort of how the relations were before the pandemic, they can use that place and, and really approach it, you know, from a point of growth and from a point of improving that relationship. I think one of the best examples 
Um, there was an article in Politico a couple weeks ago, and it was reported in New York Times, I think a year ago too. Um, the University of California at Davis um, provided uh, COVID testing for not only the students and faculty, but for the surrounding community. And that had a huge impact just, you know, epidemiologically to, you know, the cases in, in that area were, were significantly lower than, um, than cases in surrounding areas. There, there was a, a paper and a study on that. Uh, and so I think that's a really good example of a partnership that may not be, you know, that expensive. Uh, obviously, testing is, is costly, particularly at higher volumes, but, but certainly a way that colleges can help, you know, the town um, serving as I remember at Middlebury, there were initial plans to, uh, if needed, turn our hockey arena into sort of um, a field hospital during the early days of the pandemic. They had drained the ice in March 2020, anticipating if there was an influx of patients and they would need more beds, you know, the college would volunteer to, to serve as a field hospital. Uh, and I think those types of examples, particularly you know, learning from the past two years, uh, providing vaccines, uh, even you know some larger schools with medical academic medical centers serving as sites for vaccine trials, uh, serving as also medical sites for um, you know the surrounding community, um, you know university hospitals, for example, and, and I think all of those different you know ways to help the community can certainly be transferred beyond the COVID sphere. And I think one of the ways that, that I've been thinking about this, maybe not necessarily for the local community, but particularly for the college community, is thinking now of, of you know, there's been a lot of talk of, of health and, and wellness over the last, you know, decade or so. Um, but, but thinking of the college as a health hub and thinking about oh, how oh. colleges can provide, you know, health care and, and, and better, you know, supplies and, and tools for, for students, faculty, staff, and, and even the surrounding community. Thinking you know, COVID testing, for example, COVID vaccines, you know, potentially even, you know, there's been discussion, uh, particularly in, in some colleges uh, in states where abortions are, um, you know, less accessible, having colleges provide abortion, you know, medication and, and pills and, and stuff like that. So really thinking, you know, what can the college provide and what the college has the resources to provide? Uh, well, I think there's a, a really infinite range of possibilities there that, that colleges can continue, you know, to serve local communities. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Thank you. That's a very positive look. Um, and I love the idea of a health hub. Uh, I want to come back to that um, later on before we end. Um, uh, in, in the chat, we've had uh, people sharing different resources about some of the points that you've raised, Benji. Um, and uh, we've also had some, uh, I think, some uh, suspicions about uh, uh, universities and colleges not doing enough. Um, one person mentions uh, campus deliberately not listening to data. Um, Tom mentions uh, not wanting to disrupt fall football schedules, for example. Um, and um, you know, looking back on this, I wonder what did we learn about uh, inter-campus collaboration? To what extent did we see colleges and universities team up together and work with each other, both locally but also at a larger scale, internationally or nationally? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll start on the, on the local level and, and sort of within a college. There was certainly a, a lot, at least from some of my experiences and, and what I've been working on and reading, I think there was a lot of collaboration, you know, when it came to campus reopening, you know, working, as you had mentioned, you know, between athletics and working with student life, working with, you know, academic departments. There were a lot of conversations, you know, on campus reopening. And I remember attending some forums where attendees really, Although they worked at the same institution, they really had never, you know, met each other or even sort of, you know, worked with each other before. Um, so the pandemic certainly provided a lot of, you know, the need for for collaboration and and just in general for people to to work across, you know, different disciplines academically and, and as well as different offices and, and services on a, a larger college level. I think when when it comes to collaboration, you know, globally, you know, virtual. There was a lot of talk, I think, initially in the higher ed you know, media and other you know, places about virtual study abroad and seeing if that's a sort of a, a substitution for study abroad. I think in the short term, certainly that can be possible. But I think in, in the longer term, I think, you know, obviously now with a lot of most of the world being open, uh, I think there is, you know, there, we're going to go back to a sort of a, a normal study abroad experience where people will travel to places. But I think, you know, beyond 
from the, the traditional study abroad experience, there are other ways that colleges collaborated globally for you know lectures and for speakers. I remember at least at Middlebury for the first couple of years, I was working on a couple of speaker series, you know, um, academically and, and through some other student life departments. And I remember every time you know we had to sign a contract with the speaker, they we would fly them in, we would pay for them to fly in, they would have to stay somewhere. And for those mm -hmm. who, who do not know rural Vermont, you know, the availability of a lot of different services that you would traditionally find in cities like car services and and flights and hotels, you know, were certainly, you know, there were challenges there. Um, so I, I think, you know, the virtual world when it comes to lectures and guest speakers uh, and all different types of visits, I think there's just now an impetus to continue a lot of that. And I think that that's great. I think you know, it really, particularly for people who may not be able to travel, particularly for people who, you know, or schools that are located in areas where it may be hard to get to, there's a lot of room, I think, for collaboration when it comes to, you know, bringing, giving students a lot of those experiences that they may not have really gotten before in a fully in-person, you know, in environment. Do you think overall, um, do you think we are more, the higher education is more digitally immersed uh, than it was in, say, January 2020? I, I think so. I think for, for most of you know, the population, I think, you know, I remember using Zoom a little bit, but for most people I had never really heard of, of Zoom or, or Teams or, you know, Blue Jeans or any of those types of platforms. And I think a lot of those will certainly continue beyond the simple reason of holding a Zoom meeting because it, you know, may be safer for, you know, than, than a fully in-person meeting. Um, but I think a lot of those different technologies will <coughs> certainly continue you know, in, in the next couple of years, I think being able to, you know, use it for, for lectures, for guest speakers, for for academic events. Um, it, it, it is, I think, a newer version of, you know, for some schools, particularly in the K through 12 space, you know, having like pen pals for people, you know, for with a exchange with a school across the world or something like that. You know, then the new pen pal is now sort of this this Zoom you know, mm -hmm. entire, you know, experience in, in universe in that way, where there's, there's so many possibilities uh, to hear from people, you know, to really get people's stories and get people's experiences and, and use technology to do that. And I think what Zoom has done particularly is it's not a, it has a lot of you know, power and a lot of capability, but it's not a technologically hard tool to use. You don't need to have a full video conference room. You can, you know, set up a computer somewhere and you can, you know, have people join that way. Uh, and I think it's certainly lowered the barrier for educate a lot of you know, forms of educational technology in that way, because it's so easy to use and, and, and so easy to, to have those experiences without a lot of technology. Well, that's a huge takeaway um, from this pandemic. That's a historic shift, a, a nudge forward in digitalization, as the Europeans say. Um, uh, Lisa asks a question that relates to that. Um, which is, uh, how has this changed pedagogy in higher education? Yeah, I think, um, you know, from, from my personal experience having, you know, it was pedagogically quite challenging as, as the recipient of, of a lot of, you know, the, the teaching. It was pedagogically quite challenging in the spring of 2020 um, because, uh, you know, a lot of faculty had not adjusted, you know, understandably, we had no real knowledge of, of using Zoom. But I think using you know Zoom to teach effectively was was certainly quite challenging in, in the first couple of weeks. In addition, you know obviously the the just scenario and the situation around the country was was quite grim at that time, and so I think it was hard mentally for a lot of students and faculty to have those rich pedagogical experiences in the first part of the pandemic. I think that certainly got better in in you know the the past couple semesters now having you know into sort of a third pandemic year where you know, in person learning has resumed to to you know in much of the country and, and many schools and, and most courses are in person but i think pedagogically it really opens the possibility to have other types of experiences that may not be in a fully you know lecture based course i know a lot of uh, my professors at the time had sort of changed you know, formats or teaching into, you know, we talked a little bit, um, I think there's been discussion in education about the flipped classroom, you know, having people um, 
prepare for a lesson, you know, by watching a lecture or watching a video and then having the class be more of a Socratic style discussion uh, on, you know, on the material. I think, you know, a lot of my professors had sort of used that method because it was just easier to have a, a sort of a video recorded lecture and then we could spend time, you know, in discussion. Uh, and so I think a lot of those different types of strategies will, will hopefully continue because I think discussion based courses, you know, to the extent that they're possible uh, and other real, you know, types of, of teaching, you know, not just not just, you know, discussions, but but other experiential activities, um, not just, you know, the traditional field trip of like going to a place, but but really having those interactions and those connections, levering, leveraging those connections on a, on a university front. I think we'll hopefully you know, stay with us past past these couple of years. Yeah, that's a good call. That's a very good call. Thank you. Um, in the uh, in the chat, uh, our friend Charles Findlay has made a couple of uh, great responses uh, to some of your notes, uh, Benji. He, he points out that Northeastern Uni Northeastern Boston campus just added contraceptive vending machines, uh, which is one way of using that campus space. Uh, for community purposes, uh, but he also adds that he thinks the uh, the mindset about digital technology has changed. Uh, there are more virtual meetings, or they are added to in person events now. Uh, I, I've been thinking for a while that we have a kind of high flex as a baseline. Um, that you know, what we're doing right now, entirely online, is one one whole of that and the other is of course entirely in person no digital component but um but perhaps what we uh, should be expecting is a kind of centering around that mixed virtual plus in-person environment yeah I, I think you know there's certainly a lot of uh, of you know merit to sort of having necessarily a, a virtual first environment particularly because it, it can be more inclusive it can include a lot more people um, but I, I think, you know, one thing that I've also been thinking about is, uh, particularly for, for me, I, you know, I attended school at a liberal arts institution where 95, I think, percent of students lived on campus. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the student life, the academics, everything would really occur in a central location, uh, albeit a very large campus, but, but a, a sort of one place. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, no, I don't want to say it's in person first, but but I think there, there's still going to be a lot of anchoring, obviously, around the traditional college. I, I don't think you know a virtual only college experience will, will you know sort of succeed in that way. Um, but I think using you know virtual technology, using a lot of the you know the virtual world in that way to have adding on to a, a centralized experience. But I, I think you know, nothing can really replace people gathering in one space for a you know an event or a class or, or something like that quite true quite true uh friends uh i'm driving this with far too many of my own questions and comments which is which is ridiculous uh and i'm going to right now ventriloquize a question uh this came in actually from uh, a really good friend who couldn't make it today um and uh who uh, is the head of NizerNet, one of our found one of our sponsors um, and I wanted to thank her for this. Um, uh, Jeannie uh, Cazares asked, looking ahead, the broader question is not simply what we have learned, but what new changes are we willing to undertake? And I, I wonder if you, if you want to wrestle with that question a bit. Um, you know, what, what, does, what have we learned about our ability to make changes and what other changes, at least in terms of public health, do you think higher ed has a capacity to undertake? Yeah, I, I'll start on the public health side, and then I'll, I'll go on to sort of the, the more you know traditional higher ed space. I think, I think when it comes to public health, obviously a lot of the, the tools that colleges have used, testing, um, you know, masking, a lot of those different types of tools, our, our way to use those tools has, has changed over the two years uh, of the pandemic. Initially, a lot of schools were testing every week, uh, and that was a strategy that I certainly supported. We had done some research on you know, what schools were using, what testing strategies, um, and, and testing every week was really, at the time, was a really good way to keep infections lower. Um, yeah. I, I think at, you know, in the post-vaccine era, um, and particularly in the last couple months, you certainly don't want everyone, you know, being infected at, at once, but, but you are going to have infections on, on a campus uh, now. And, and for the vast majority of people, that will, you know, result in, in a mild case. Um, and, and, you know, the, the threat of severe illness 
has been significantly reduced because of a vaccine. So I think our, our way to use the tools, you know, for example, testing now when there are symptoms or, you know, having a wide, you know, having tests widely available, I think is certainly a, a great you know, way to use testing now, but not necessarily testing everyone every week. Um, so I think there's certainly still a lot of room for investment in those tools, you know, testing, having masking widely available. I know, you know, Charles had mentioned, you know, having contraceptive tools available in vending machines. I know there was, a, I think, school in California that was also doing that, having masks and having tests available in, in vending machines. Um, so ensuring that those tools are, are widely available uh, and equally accessible to members of the college community, I think, is a, a change that, that, you know, that's a change that I think a lot of colleges have, have grasped onto and, and ensuring that students have the tools, you know, to be protected. I think when it comes to other sort of changes, I, you know, COVID had obviously disrupted the traditional academic, you know, world and academic calendar in that way, you know, having, you know, switched to a virtual method of instruction early on in, in March of 2020. Uh, but I think one of the things that at least at, at Middlebury, and I know a lot of other schools have this um, before we have what's known as a Feb program where students matriculate in February midway through the year and then graduate four years later uh, in February of that year. Um, I know a lot of schools, I think Northeastern, for example, offers, you know, incoming first year students the opportunity to, to study abroad for their first semester and then matriculate on campus. I think there will be a, a, a little bit of, of motion towards sort of that flexible college experience, thinking beyond yeah. Yeah. the four traditional years where you come in in one September and graduate four years later. Um, Obviously, a lot of students had taken semesters off because of, of virtual education. They may not have wanted to have a, a fully virtual semester. They may have had other plans uh, to, to travel or spend you know, a semester elsewhere. And I think that flexible college experience, I hope you know, colleges will continue to embrace in the, in the coming years. Being able for students to have the opportunity to gain whatever they would like. If that means, you know, they, they take an internship for the fall semester and then come back to school in the spring semester, um, you know, graduate midway through the year, if that's an option. I think a lot of those changes, I think colleges are, are thinking about, and, and I think in my opinion, should, should certainly embrace um, to give students the opportunity to, to, you know, explore their interests, both academically, pre-professionally, you know, around the world, um, a lot of different areas, I think, for, for students to experience beyond the traditional, you know, on campus for, for all four years. Hmm. Hmm. Well, this is really good. Thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. That's a really, really great answer. Um, thank you, Jeannie, for the good question. Uh, we have time, I think, for uh, four really quick questions before we run out of time. Uh, and one of them comes from Keith Young uh, at uh, CMU. And we just bring his up here on the screen for everyone to see. So what Will the post-COVID ubiquity of virtual teaching lead prospective learners to more regularly consider alternative providers of instruction as a side effect of the net increase in digitalization? Yeah, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of thinking beyond traditional, the role of a traditional college professor or instructor in that way, you know, thinking about other, other ways to receive instruction, I think a lot of that, you know, the availability and not just the availability of virtual technology, but also the familiarity that people have with it. Now people are, are able to use technology to, in, in a classroom setting. People are able to, to use, you know, technology in, in other different, you know, whether it's a guest lecture or something like that. I think there is certainly a motivation to continue having those different types of at Middlebury, at least we called you know called them professors of the practice, which were mm -hmm. practitioners um, who may not have come from a traditional academic, you know, PhD carrying background, um, but for those people who are experts in their relevant fields. I remember one we had was a um, someone who served in state government. Another one was a public health practitioner who had, who had spent some time working in, in the public health sphere. Uh, and I think those types of courses, being able to offer those types of courses, is certainly a, creates a really rich experience for students. Um, thinking beyond at least the, you know, the traditional liberal arts, offering those different types of, not necessarily pre-professional, but, but courses that may be relevant to certain sectors of the workforce, 
courses that may be relevant to other areas that may not traditionally be covered in a college education. And I think being able to use outside um, instruction, not necessarily from sort of an outside you know, entity or company, but, but practitioners or people who may not be co-located on the campus, I think the virtual world certainly facilitates the opportunity to have those types of experiences and, and have those courses. And I hope that, would, that will certainly continue. Well, that's a good answer. That's a very good answer. Um, and uh, thank you for the question, uh, Keith. Uh, something to keep an eye out for. Uh, we have a question from our good friend, Ruben Puetador. Uh, and Ruben asks what you think about the impact of long COVID. Um, you know, we have some number of, of faculty, staff, and students who are enduring this, this curse. Um, what kind of impact is that going to be having on colleges and universities? Yeah, I think long COVID is, is certainly real and is certainly a serious issue um, that has impacted many people, uh, regardless of whether they had a you know, severe infection. There are people who, you know, had a so-called mild infection and, and even end up, you know, having long-term symptoms. I think long COVID just on a national and even global level is not, it needs to be further studied and needs to be understood better. We don't know what's necessarily causing that, whether that's a you know, persistent virus that is remaining in, you know, in the body or whether that's some other different, you know, are there triggers, are there sort of um, things that, that make individuals predisposed to having long COVID. And a lot of that, hopefully in the next couple of years with, with more studies and, and more funding for research, will hopefully you know, make a lot of that clearer. I think when it comes to the you know, colleges, it's just, it's honestly quite challenging to provide support for individuals with long COVID just because we don't necessarily know what resources are needed to support these individuals um, with longer term symptoms. There are long COVID clinics that have been set up. Um, there, there is no, you know, cure all drug or treatment that can you know, currently, that we know of that can treat long COVID. So a lot of these long COVID clinics have focused on you know, managing symptoms with, with other drugs, maybe repurposed from, from other, you know, treating other illnesses. Uh, and, and colleges can certainly, you know, play a role in, you know, maybe referring people to those you know, resources. But I think it will be very hard for a college to, to set up, you know, that type of, you know, support structure, just because it's very hard to, to do even on a national level. Um, but, but I think in, in general, you know, being supportive, you know, having flexible, you know, work schedules or having flexible teaching schedules. I think a lot of that can be used as not necessarily a, you know, a cure-all or, or, you know, strategy, but, but I think will hopefully help a lot of individuals, you know, with longer term symptoms. Uh, and I, I hope our understanding will, will change in, in the coming months and, and years, you know, and hopefully we'll have, you know, treatments or, or whether there are, you know, for example, a pan coronavirus vaccine or a nasal vaccine that will hopefully do a better job at preventing yes. infections, which will prevent you know long COVID. I think a lot of those advance advancements will will come in the coming years, and will certainly have you know impacts, you know if deployed, you know impacts for for college campuses and, and the community. Thank you, thank you, a uh, great answer, and and Ruben, thank you for the question, uh, which is really really good. Uh, Charles comes out of the chat and he asks a, a, a question, which I want to share up here. Um, is, is it possible that the newer digital access that occurred will break up ownership of courses and degrees to create easy movement among all colleges? Yeah, I think you know, there could be some sort of transferability there. I, I don't know that much when it when it comes to sort of degree, you know, the, the intricacies of, of degree programs. Um, but but I think there is, particularly you know, in sort of the model that I've been thinking about, and we've discussed a little bit of of having a, a flexible type four years, where you know, for example, and, and this has been. We thought a lot about this at Middlebury in particular, just because Middlebury has a large global footprint. We own our own study abroad programs in, in um, 17 countries. I think it's now 33 or 34 sites around the world. Uh, we have a graduate school in, in, in Monterey, the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey in California. And so I think at least in Middlebury, there's always been this conversation of having flexible uh, academic programs for people being able as a student, being able to take your first two years at Middlebury, 
you know, spend your whole year abroad and your junior year and then your senior year being able to get a head start on a master's degree program uh, by spending a semester at Monterey and, and, and ensuring, because we own all of those programs, ensuring that all of those credits and all of those academic, you know, lessons will, will transfer across all, all those courses and, and all those places. I think that, you know, that can certainly be applied to, to larger universities, too, and, and maybe even in, in between universities. I, I don't know necessarily too much uh, about that. But, but thinking, you know, beyond the traditional four-year college um, and, and into other, you know, academic programs, I, I know a lot of, you know, schools have also done, like, dual degree programs. I know we had one in engineering, you know, the three plus two, you spend your three years at, in undergrad and then do two years at an engineering school. I think a lot of those collaborations and partnerships, I hope will, will you know, continue and I hope we'll see new ones of those, you know, different areas of, of study and, and beyond, you know, pre-professional, beyond engineering, maybe having something more in the humanities or social sciences. I think, you know, we'll see, see some of that. Very nice. Good foresight. Uh, Charles, thank you for the terrific question. Um, in, the, in the chat, someone mentions having, uh, uh, being able to take uh, classes at two other institutions besides their own college of record. Now, let me ask if I can point you a little further ahead a bit. Um, the the late uh, philosopher of science, Bruno Latour, suggested that we might view the COVID experience as a kind of test run for how humanity responds to climate change, um, which is, of course, a far vaster and slower moving uh, crisis. Uh, I'm wondering if you could follow that logic a bit. Um, you know, what have we learned from uh, from this experience, which is still going on, of COVID, uh, mm -hmm. that might help point the way to how higher education and indeed society uh, will be able to grapple with uh, the Anthropocene. Yeah, I think the um, I think one of the things I'll start off with the, the College Crisis Initiative at, at Davidson College, which has been a tremendous uh, resource, uh, and not only for for higher higher ed research for COVID. But I think it was initially set up by, by Dr. Mark Sacano there and, and the team as a way to study how colleges respond to crises and beyond necessarily a pandemic. Uh, they, had, they had started, you know, I think, a year or so before the pandemic and, and obviously the pandemic being a large crisis, um, pivoted a lot of their resources and their research to, to COVID. But I think beyond the pandemic, I think, you know, humans are, are resistant to change, but somewhat adaptable, I think. Um, and, and using um, you know the college community as an example and thinking about how um, communication works in times of crisis uh, as you mentioned obviously the climate crisis would be a more slower moving crisis there's not going to be one tuesday in march uh, unless you know the college is underwater i guess but but you know there's not going to be a tuesday in march where you know instruction is going to shift and there's going to be this large change um, but I think a lot of the lessons when it comes to communication, a lot of the lessons when it comes to support, um, you know, one of the examples thinking of like supportive isolation for students who had COVID in, in the, year, the first academic year, you know, for colleges to provide those resources for students uh, to isolate safely, to have food delivered for them so they can keep up on their studies. I think a lot of those lessons when it comes to those issues it, are transferable beyond the pandemic and into future crises. Uh, and I think, you know, the, there was no textbook on to, you know, to handle pandemic. I remember when I was studying abroad in China, there was um, sort of like, you know, in the study abroad office, there was a, a paper with some of the sort of potential issues that may happen. You know, one of them was like, you know, security issue or, or terrorism or stuff like that. And there was one that said pandemic like SARS, which was the, the first, um, you know, SARS in 2003. And this being the second sort of severe SARS pandemic, um, and I was like, "Oh, that's that's interesting." I'd sort of never really heard of that before. Fast forward, you know, two weeks, two to three weeks later, uh, and that was certainly applicable. But but I think you know there was no textbook for the pandemic. Uh, but I think there are lessons you know that we discussed other, other issues. There are lessons that we can use beyond a public health crisis and and, and into you know future you know whether it's climate change. Or, or you know, changing demographic crises or, or mm -hmm. other different issues. I think colleges can still play a huge role in tackling a lot of those issues. Well, that's a fantastic point to end on. 
Um, Benji, I, I appreciate your timing, your optimism, and your ability to have wrangled and addressed a whole series of questions from a wide range of areas, everything from the Vermont later to the future of higher education. Um, thank you so much. What, what's, what's the best way to keep up with you in your work right now? Uh, is that Twitter or somewhere else? Yeah, I, I think Twitter has certainly been a forum that, I, that I've been using. I'm at BH Renton um, on Twitter, or, or, and I you know, tweet about you know, research that I've done, research that I've seen that's interesting. Uh, the newsletter, which Brian linked on the bottom left of your screen, is, is also a way to um, you know, follow some of my previous work on higher education. I, I stopped the newsletter in, in May. It was a weekly endeavor, and I stopped it in May of last year. Uh, but, but depending on you know, the work, I, I may also use that as a forum. Um, so I think you know those two ways of, uh, are certainly a great way to, to keep up with, with some of the work that I've been doing. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for all that work, Benji. Congratulations on the uh, starting a great career, and uh, we really, really appreciate all of your time here today. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for everyone for attending and, and really asking a lot of those great questions. Oh, our pleasure, our pleasure. Take care. But don't everybody leave. Uh, just pointing you ahead to where we're headed over the next few weeks. If you want to keep talking about this, please uh, hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag FTTE. Or, of course, you can uh, find me on my blog, brianalexander.org. Um, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions uh, on the pandemic, we have a whole stack of them, plus a whole bunch of sessions on other topics. Just go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. Uh, if you'd like to look ahead to our next sessions, go to forum.futureofeducation.us, and you can see those. And if you want to share any of your own work, be it pandemic-related or other, please just drop me a line. I'd be glad to share with everybody else. In the meantime, thank you all for coming today. This is a vital topic, although it is a very heavy one. Um, I appreciate the chance to meet with all of you and to enjoy your questions. Please, everybody, um, stay away from me, at least for the next few days, in person. Uh, everybody, take care. Be safe. And we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.